bought 2,000 pairs and had them distributed at the tea houses. Then I, I tried to go back four or five years later to shoot and they wouldn't let me anywhere near the plate. Ed Bertinsky's large format photographs hang in galleries around the world. His work chronicles the relationship between the natural world and industry, and his pictures, while often disturbing, carry with them an unmistakable beauty. Ed, I wanted to start by asking you about, normally I would ask you about your background, and I will in a while, but I wanted to ask you about something that is, uh, even by the time this interview airs and people are watching us, this will still be, I'm sure, a top of mind issue, and that's what's happening in the Gulf of Mexico. A while ago, there was a picture on the front page of the Globe that was one of yours, I believe, of what was happening, that oil spill. And I know that you have said in the past, given the work that you've done around the world and the photographs you've taken, you have said that oil connects everything. When I saw that picture of yours in the Globe, that was the, that was the quote of yours that I thought of right away. First of all, tell me about that. You went down, what was it, what, did it look really bad to you? Did it look different from some of the things you've already seen? Um, well, I was at the, um, in the Gulf mm -hmm. about three weeks ago. So this was after about two weeks of, uh, of the oil spewing into the Gulf. <clears throat> and what was interesting is that it wasn't that visible. Mm -hmm. what, I, what I thought I was going to see and what I saw was actually quite a surprise. And where there was a lot of concentrations of these shrimp boats with the booms that are hiking out over their boats to try and pick up the oil, we hovered over that for a while and it just seemed kind of like a, you know, just a, a make work project for the, uh, for the uh, shrimpers mm -hmm. uh, in that, you know, the oil was slipping underneath the booms, it was splashing over the booms and there was nothing in the scoops. They were just going around through this slick and not capturing any of it. So I think this quality of this oil was quite different as well. It's not that thick yeah. black stuff. Yeah. It's more of this thinner orange uh, oil and, and for I think many reasons that's why it doesn't surface as well. Oh, okay. And so you can't really you know you know really see it. You see the the separation of the actual um, the slick, which is like more like an oil slick you'd see, you know, from a gas station or whatever. If if if, if gas landed on water, so oh, okay. it's more right. of the uh, I think the high octane stuff right. kind of comes up. You know, it evaporates off and then and then you know, creates some residue slick on it mm -hmm. as well. But um, but when we then when we were there, there wasn't much that hit the shores yet. Uh, and um, and you know, with the three thousand foot ceiling, um, at that distance, you really have a hard time getting a sense of what's really going on. Mm -hmm. And you can see a lot of evidence of the oil, but it's kind of under the water. Yeah. It feels like it's like three or four feet yeah. underwater from where you can see it. And then as soon as you get any chop at all, which is, you know, there's almost a continuous chop happening uh, in a big body of water like that. Then, then it even disguises what's really going on um, there as well. So, uh, all things considered, um, it, 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 I think the disaster is far more, um, uh, um, I guess, treacherous yes. than the images allow yeah. us to it's see. It's insidious. It's That's insidious. Right. Yeah. yeah, it's yeah. below. It's kind of out of, out of, uh, off of our visual scope. Yeah. And, and but uh, apparently, the, some of the bigger problems are these plumes that they're talking about, which are. Some are like 120 miles long and you know 15 miles wide and a couple hundred feet deep and and these are just large oil plumes under the water that could be at five six hundred feet a uh, thousand feet below. So the concern is that 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 the real danger here is that um, you know the the, the devastation is really happening on the seabed and under the water yeah. and we're just seeing very very small bits and pieces that are hitting the shores because when you think of it. It's a day day 54. Um, if if one spill like this happened in one day, it would be considered a catastrophe. Yeah. We've had 54 days of it, yeah. so we've had and it's ongoing. And it's ongoing, yeah. so we've yeah. had 54. Oh, yeah. You know, uh, any one of those days would have been considered yeah. you know on record as a really bad yeah. day for oil. And Let me ask you then about about your starting out because you started doing nature photography. Right. That was that was the initial thing that you started doing. And I, I, I remember reading a quote from you at one point where you said you began to realize that nature photography had had was had basically been taken over by the calendars and the, that sort of thing, that it was no longer it didn't it was your sense that it was no longer something legitimate to do. Well, that, 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 like when I did, um, you know, the, just photographing what I call pristine nature, <clears throat> even though I was 
trying to reference a lot of other things in art, art history like abstract expressionism and trying to find some kind of way of flattening the landscape and dealing with large format color film and, and, and working with ideas of color and form and all of those things. Um, but still going into that pristine landscape, for me it felt like um, that it was kind of moving back to this uh, notion of, of, of um, the untouched world, the pristine landscape, and it seemed that that, that world has already been kind of documented or, or it's been photographed, and it's almost like a genre now. It's like a cliche, yeah. and no matter how I tried to liberate it from that, I couldn't, and um, or I felt I couldn't, and, and, and so then um, I began to think about uh, you know the places I had seen and where I'd worked in the past, and and this was large industries. So yeah. I thought, well, this is our transformation of that landscape. That's probably uh, more current or, or to our time than than the looking back to 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 the pristine landscape. I mean, one can say that by showing that pristine landscape, it it, it might. Uh, encourage us to want to preserve it, but I, I thought if it hasn't done that yet, right. why would my images, you know, move move consciousness to that direction? But yeah. I thought um, what would be more interesting is to show the loss of that world to at our hand, and so that then the the whole idea of industry and how it how it uh, creates this incursion into that landscape became the interesting thing for me yeah. to begin to focus on. You got lost on a car trip in Pennsylvania or something. Wasn't that the, your sort of turning point, your, your, uh, your Rosicrucian, Rosicrucian moment of enlightenment? Or? Well, my, I guess you know, my <laughs> aha moment, yes. yeah. Well, it, it, I was photographing this pristine landscaping, trying to get my head around it, and I made a wrong turn, and then to, to, to not have to double back, I, I cut across country and uh, ended up in this small town called Frackville. And I stopped, and it was like uh, like a one industry town. It was a coal industry, and I remember you know going to the outskirts of the town and getting up on this um, mound of uh, of uh, waste uh, that that was part of the coal mining process, and standing on it. And the water was this kind of ultramarine, greeny blue, totally surreal. And these birches were just popping through these uh, slag heaps, and I started photographing it and and thinking, wow, this is more interesting than the stuff I've been trying to photograph. There's something going on here. And then when I got back, I processed the film, you know, made contacts and tried printing the original idea of, of these landscapes. And then I turned to those nags and started printing them. And I said, no, no, this is actually um, the thing that's most interesting. I, and I had worked in mines and I had seen them, but I had never contemplated them. Yeah as a subject. And then it was there that all of a sudden I thought, okay, this is actually, um, this, this is saying something more about the wastelands that we create um, as a result of you know, acquiring the things that we need for our day-to-day -day ex exist existence. And there's, I didn't see any artists who were entering that world of that landscape. Yeah. Um, Where'd you go from there though? I mean, so, so you have that moment, that aha moment. You look at these things and think, yes, this is, this is something that's worth documenting. Then where did you then where did you go? How did you proceed after that? Well, then I uh, what I did then is uh, I, I started to do a bit more work myself uh, by car. I was going up to Sudbury and getting into right. Sudbury, and this was like eighty two, eighty three, and then I had enough, acquired enough work, enough about a half a dozen or a dozen prints or so, and I applied for a grant to then go across country. Right. And so in 83, I received um, a Canada Council grant and was able to go right across Canada. And at that time, it was you know, pre-internet and pre-acquisition of, of information. So uh, I found myself um, going to you know, mining, you know, mining trades magazines to find out who the big players are. Oh, okay. uh, I was using going to the government and going and looking at mineral maps to see where the highest deposits of, of minerals were recorded, and then I'd say, "Oh, look in you know in, in, in BC, there's a lot of you know uh, you know the dots, the size of the dot, and the color was an indicator. Like, oh, here's a lot of copper here. So I'd say, "Oh, I'm going to go over there 
you know, I didn't know even what the town was in it to sort of overlay that to a map and say, oh, that's around Kamloops area. Huh. You know, that's high. So okay. then I kind of found where the minerals were, I figured where the mines were. And then I went there and I asked around and say, are there any big mines around here? You know, <laughs> and uh, they'd say, oh yeah, there's one up there, you know, and I'd go and knock on the door yeah. and hi, can I meet the general manager? I'm, you know, traveling around. So that's, the, like I said, the today I would never work that way. Yeah. I don't have that kind of time where I can just, you know, camp outside the door of a mine for four days waiting for the general manager to make up his mind. And you yeah. did that sometimes? Oh, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Because, I mean, how did you pitch yourself to them? I mean, uh, they're, obviously you're not coming in to do glamour shots of their operation. What did you tell them? Well, I worked it as a miner. And so I had, uh, so I even had all my stuff from mining, okay. you know, so I had steel toe boots. Um, and I went in there with a portfolio and I said, look, I, you know, I've you know, worked in the mines and I'm now doing a, a documentary project photographing the biggest mines across North America. Um, and the reason why, you know, you're on my list is you're a very large operation. Um, you know, could you let me in? And, um, and quite more often than not, their curiosity, and I had about a, usually like a dozen prints, so I'd show them what I've done. Oh, this is, this is Inco in Sudbury, and this is the stuff I did in Pennsylvania with coal mining, and blah, blah, blah. And they'd see it, and, and they'd say, oh, okay, you know, they could see what I'm doing. Um, and, um, you know, I said, I'm working with a large format camera, and oftentimes the general manager himself would go with me. In a truck and say, "Let's go for the afternoon, and we'll, you know, I'll show huh. you around." Okay. So, so it was, I think, this curiosity for them to see what, I, how I would see their operation yeah. and what I would take away from that situation. That often was what I think, you know, uh, motivated them to to, to let me in, um, and also the fact that I think I was aware of the language, you know, and how they talked, and I worked in these kinds of places, so I was very comfortable in, and, and I understood kind yeah. of, um, you know, how they operate. And, and so I was very familiar, so they never felt that I was kind of at risk in that kind of environment since I, 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 had, I had worked in those kinds yeah. of environments. Now, I'm assuming that it would be once, once you progressed into going international and, and documenting places in other parts of the world, China and Bangladesh and so on, that access must have been even more of a problem and quite different from what you just described, I'm assuming. Well, yeah, access is always, um, uh, the way I point out is I get maybe, you know, 70% of what I'm after and 30% is still, you know, elusive. I can't get at it. Mm. Um, but I figure that's still a pretty good ratio. And, and quite frankly, I think it's been largely because, you know, I've tried to find a, a way, a, you know, a way to cut through that space, you know, which is very complex but by being very careful as to how you know I represent the work and and to how I see, you know see the work um, you know functioning out there so I do like to keep the work in a fairly open narrative I mm -hmm. don't try to lock it down you know as a yeah. as a political work I don't try to lock it down as as strictly a, a study in aesthetics and form I think you know that that to me you know both the form and the content have to be equally weighted. So the image should be an interesting, you know, image in and of itself, and the color and the texture and the line and the uh, composition and all that, to me, has to, has to function. But also the content uh, um, has to be equal as well, so that, that the ideas behind why this place and how does this fit into the larger context of the work. So, you know, each image relates to the other. They all mm -hmm. share. Um, you know, uh, in the idea of these, uh, this, these images um, uh, as a whole, as a collective yeah. body of work, you know, are describing a lot of, you know, who we are as humans and how we're trans, trans, transforming the planet. Yeah, yeah I'm interested in, the, in your, your idea of the open narrative in these pictures because it, I, 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 I've heard you talk about that before and I thought, well, you know, um, it has to be a very fine line, as you say, between the, the piece as a, as a work that stands in, alone in, in and of itself and then the the content of it as well but are not the what you the first of all the large format or whether you choose to do it in color or choose to do it in black and white are those not decisions that you make that in that in, in effect are 
uh, offering the foundation for someone to make a judgment based on that. So it's not really an open narrative so much as one that's, that you might be slightly coloring yourself depending on on the, the way you decide to present the print. Well, I mean, the prints that I'm, uh, I'm doing are usually, number one, highly detailed. So I'm mm -hmm. using large formats. So that gives, gives um, me the ability to make large, you know, four foot by five foot prints, which then the viewer can step into and have a kind of a, what I call a body experience with that landscape. So you, you end up with a vertigo or this feeling of, of scale where, you know, the, the, um, the figures are dwarfed in this vast landscape or the, the thing that you can identify, a, yeah. a barrel of, uh, of oil or a ladder or something that has human scale to it. Um, then allows you to reinterpret that landscape, and I think, um, you know, th that allows uh, the w the work to kind of have a uh, kind of a, a sense of wonder embedded in it. Mm. And I think that, to me, um, is when you start to capture the viewers that if if they're engaged with the work, they'll 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 enter it. And I think in terms of, of what's being said, I, I think it'd be hard for you to go, like, let's say where the work is compiled as a body of work, whether it's oil or whether it's quarries or whether it's China. You know, if you go through all 80 images and somehow if you don't understand that what I'm trying to point out in this whole thing is that the human species in is, is in a you know, a gripping moment of overreach, mm -hmm. you know, we're, 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 we're actually going, you know, to a dangerous place, you know, in the scale in which we're operating, that we're starting to tilt, you know, the limits of, of what we're doing. And I think that, you know, is a, the, a subtext, you know, throughout yeah. all the work, but, um, you know, no one image contains that, but if you see them in aggregate, I think you, it'd be hard to walk away thinking, wow, this is, this is <laughs> this great. Is great. <laughs> yeah. I, love what, I love what we're doing yeah, out there. Yeah. <laughs> Tell me about some of the places. I know that when it, the, they're hanging, actually hanging on your walls here in your studio, too, are some of the pictures of the, I guess it's Bangladesh, where the, where the oil tankers, the, the decommissioned oil tankers, are just left to rot, and then, and then people come in and, 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 uh, and salvage them and scavenge them for pieces of, of metal and so on. Um, I, I, what, what you've documented in that situation, to me, st struck me as being so completely depressing and, and awful because here are these tankers that are just, I mean, they're basically being thrown away, aren't they? Well, they're being sold. I mean, they're being sold for ah. scrap tonnage. Yeah. Um, and, um, and, and, and in this particular case in, in, in uh, Bangladesh, um, it, it was pretty hard to, to witness that. It was pretty hard to re, you know, stare that one in the eye yeah. because <clears throat> it was, the conditions were so appalling that I'd never seen anything like it. I didn't even think that anything like that could exist um, in that you know, it wouldn't be anything to see guys you know, covered in oil, crude oil from head to toe with just the whites of their eyes showing or, and carrying you know, oil on their head in, in um, something that looks like a walk or, you know, seeing a bunch of guys smashing away at a heater core, not knowing that what it's all been floated in is asbestos that's bone dry and now becoming airborne and there's no respirator yeah. uh, or they're burning, you know, oils that are full of, you know, who knows, PCBs or, you know, dioxins and burning, I think plastic is being burned on the beach. They're cutting through, you know, the sides of the ships, which are like, you know, a quarter inch or more of marine paint, uh, and you know, setting marine paint on fire when you're this far away from it. Yeah. Um, again, who knows? You know, I, I don't. Um, I wasn't holding out much for their lifespans. No kidding. Um, but you know, there's here's you know a, a condition where, you know, all of these. You know, risky, risky things uh, that were being done uh, health-wise, and that we in the wor first world who built these things and, and know very, you know, well what's in it. Like we, we've had our fair share of industrial disasters, you know, and and from PCBs to asbestos, on and on. Um, but it's when we knowingly sell something that we that's going into a, a, a developing world condition knowing that we're, a, a lot of people are going to be put in harm's way, mm -hmm. um, you know, it, it's like, again, where I think globalism and capitalism fails to, you know, to, to contain these you know, externalizations that happen as a result and say, well, that's expedient, that's cheap. I'm going to just you know, sell it yeah. for a million dollars. I don't care. what. It's not my business. That's somebody else's business. Mm -hmm. And if they're going to, you know, die from 
from the asbestos or from cutting that marine paint, you know, it's not my problem, that's yeah. their problem. And of course, you know, to me that was um, a kind of a, a situation where, where it's, it's, it's truly um, a visible abdication mm -hmm. of responsibility. You I bought think. masks for some of those guys, did you not? Yeah, I did. Yeah, I was kind of trying to make a point that they were out, well, they, they were cutting, these guys were cutting with cutting torches and with bare eyes. There, there was no, uh, you, know, uh, you know, welding masks or yeah. cutting masks. So I kind of wrote them a note saying, you know, I couldn't bear watching them. Yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. they're going to lose their eyesight within years and if, you know, and that, that's their most precious thing as a human being. You'll never see your family or your friends again if you keep doing this. So, you know, as a gesture, I said, you guys should um, wear these and, and when they wear out, you should bother, you should bug, you know, the owner to make sure that when you're cutting, there was like 2,000 on, on the beaches or 2,000 guys that cut yeah. uh, and the rest of them were just carriers. So I, I yeah. you know, from the first sales of the print, I bought 2,000 pairs and had them distributed at the tea houses. Uh, then I, I tried to go back four or five years later to shoot, and they wouldn't let me anywhere near the place. Is that right? Yeah, I don't know if that was a connection made or not, but, huh. uh, but it was like, uh, no thank you. Um, really? So, Interesting. Yeah, I, don't, I think that they'd just rather, you know, nobody meddle with, with their business, yes. so to speak, but yeah. at the same time, uh, you know, pointing out some, some major uh, deficiencies uh, I felt was you know some uh, one small gesture hopefully yeah. towards a better world. I'm curious though, it, it, what if in your mind you felt at that point like you had you had crossed that line from being the objective documenter of these situations that by by buying goggles for these guys that somehow you had, you had sort of stepped through that camera and it was you know it was that that image. Well, the idea of whether. Uh, you know, whether buying the goggles for you know pushed me through uh, another kind of threshold and where it became more political, um, I think it was more of a humanist thing mm -hmm. that that um, you know I understood that it, that that you know there was there might have been a consequence like I might not let it let, let in again, but that that was a risk I, I thought I'd be willing to take and that I had kind of done I thought what what I could and could do. I mean there was always certainly you know more um, um, things I could have done with that mm -hmm. subject because it's such a multi-layered uh, rich subject that uh, you know any on any given day I can go there and make great photographs of yeah. it you know but I felt I did what I needed or what I could do and you know uh, and I didn't need more variants of the same thing that the story I felt was well uh, well told through what I'd captured and um, and it was, and I think photography, you know, has that capacity, you know, uh, to, um, you know, bring these things, you know, into consciousness, you know, from from outside of our our, our, our you know, uh, consciousness. And that, and to me, that was something that I felt that that work was the, you know, first body of work that really, you know, uh, did that. It, it took this largely unknown. Activity uh, and, uh, and and a lot of people became aware yeah. of of yeah. what happened as a result of the images. And I wasn't the first one. I mean, actually, Sebastian Salgado was there doing a, a project on the worker and kind of bringing a, a kind of a noble view of the worker back into our consciousness mm -hmm. uh, that you know all things are here for you know for their for, uh, labor through their labor. Um, and so he photographed it in black and white, 35, but from the worker's perspective, from the kind of toil. Oh, I see. Okay. You know, yeah. and uh, I kind of my perspective was color, large format, more formal, but from the point of view not of the toil, but of of the actual activity itself. Where do the where do our big ships go to die? Mm -hmm. You know, how how has this transformed the landscape? So, to me. The difference with my work is that there's a, a, a human dimension to it, but I think the, that, that to understand the work more, more clearly, that uh, to understand it as a lament for the loss of nature, that mm -hmm. our expansion is at a cost to, to something else, and we call that nature, and our, you know, and, and so that those beaches will, you know, it'll take a while for them to recover. Put it that no way, kidding. with all the stuff that's on them. Yeah. So, so we are despoiling these landscapes in 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 pursuit of 
um, you know, our, our uh, you know, modern lifestyles and uh, manufacturing techniques mm -hmm. and products and all that, but, but there is that other side of it <clears throat> that, we're, um, that we're largely, you know, um, sheltered from. So this work... Yeah, kind of people don't know this. They don't know about any of this stuff. It's no. just there, behind a curtain. Well, I don't want to. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, let me ask you finally, then, in our last couple of minutes, about the, whether or not this uh, doing this for the number of years that you have has has taken a toll on you, has had an impact on you. Because I, I would think that by going around and seeing these places firsthand and taking these, bringing these images to the rest of the world, that sooner or later there has to be some kind of cumulative effect on you. Has there been? Well, um, yeah. I, I guess there's. Um, I've become a bit of a specialist in wastelands, you know, and I've seen an awful lot of yeah. them, and, and I can actually start getting uh, a kind of intuitive sense of that scale, uh, of, of how we are actually really reshaping the planet. Uh, so a lot of my, you know, what's, what, what's happening with myself and having had, you know, uh, two children, and then you kind of have these kids, and then you start thinking about their future. Mm -hmm. And so I, I do believe that um, what, where I find a level of frustration growing is that there just doesn't seem a sense of urgency in, within the government or within, um, you know, the electorate as well, that people aren't kind of realizing. They're just kind of waking up to the idea that, you know, global warming, yeah, the last four or five years has certainly brought that into, into consciousness. But... But what am I to do? I'm just a small, you know, player yeah. in a bigger theater of things. I can't control anything. I'll, you know, I'll recycle my stuff and I'll, you know, uh, you know, do a few things and, and try and, um, you know, uh, I won't run the water while I shave or whatever. Which are, it's not gonna. It's great, but and that's starting to happen. But you know, our urgency is like big. Yes. It's it's like a third. Yes. It's it's like someone. You know, I think uh, Al Gore pointed out we should be looking at this as World War Three and preparing mm -hmm. for it. Listen, I, I know you're a very busy man. You've taken a lot of time today to talk to us, and I appreciate it. And uh, and it's quite obvious from this discussion that it goes way beyond just photography, doesn't it? Well, I, yeah, <laughs> I think so. I, I have to learn a lot about the world and make these pictures yeah. because it's part of that knowledge that puts me in in front of that subject. So I need to understand the subject to to actually make I think interesting and important and successful pictures of that subject so mm -hmm. as a result um, you know my my uh, venture through life is also quite educational in terms of yeah. what we're up to yeah. good to do this Ed. I appreciate it thanks very sure. much thanks. okay thanks okay. a lot okay thanks